Church family, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I want to invite you to find your place in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, this morning we're looking at verses 7 through 10. Uh, Today marks a one-year anniversary for me since I've been here as your pastor. Super Bowl Sunday was my first Sunday last year preaching for you. And we shortly thereafter began looking at John's letter, 1 John, his first letter here. And I'd preached up to chapter 3, verse number 6, and then we had a strange time begin as we uh, weren't gathered here together. I was preaching beginning uh, back in March via the internet to you. And so uh, during that time, we started looking at Mark's gospel. And so really been here in Mark and 1 John since I've been here as your pastor. We'll go back to Mark's gospel. I only have a few more passages to preach there. We'll do that for the Easter season. Uh, But this morning and uh, next Sunday morning, we want to look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 10 this morning. And I'm preaching on the subject, the problem we all have. The problem we all have. And that is plain and simple, a three-letter word uh, we call sin, S-I-N, sin. 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, John encourages his readers to have a proper perspective towards this thing called sin, our biggest problem. And the Bible here reminds us, though many in our society would want to be silent on this topic The Bible here reminds us as believers that we have to have good scriptural and spiritual sense concerning this topic. You see, according to the Bible, we all have this great problem called sin. Because of the transgression of our first parents, Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, 1 through 7, all of humankind is marked by brokenness and imperfection, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. And the Bible is clear. We all make mistakes, amen? We all stumble in many ways, as James says in James 3.1. So live life long enough, watch the news, consider your own experience, have children, you'll learn that there's indeed this thing called sin. And we're all marked by it. And man, like never before, God's people, God's church needs to have divine wisdom of how to navigate life in a broken world. I mean, we see sin all around us. If you're like me, you come into this time of worship this morning and you feel imperfect. You've had struggles this past week. You've had battles against the flesh, the world, and the devil. And if you're like me, sometimes you feel like John's readers as they receive this letter you know you need biblical wisdom for fighting sin. You see, John's readers were surrounded by some really messed up stuff. You see, in the first century world, in Asia Minor, the churches to whom John wrote, uh, there was this strange teaching that gave people permission to engage in in ungodly lifestyles. And so this teaching had even crept into the church where people were saying, you're free in Jesus and the spiritual realm is all that matters, so live however you want to live. And John wrote to such readers in verses 7 through 10 and gave them a message. He wanted them to know how to deal with the problem we all have, sin, S-I-N, sin. Our children Uh, like this current game show that's out called The Floor is Lava. Has anybody seen this show? All right, nobody? You need to, I think it's on Netflix. You need to check it out. But it's one of those shows maybe the boys will watch and I'm like, I don't have any time for a show like that. I don't watch much TV. I'm so busy. If I walk through the living room and see it on, I might stop for a minute and then I get sucked into the show. So the floor is lava is one of those. I think we have a picture from this show this morning we can put on the screens here. Maybe. Maybe not. All right. So the floor is lava. So the deal is the floor looks like lava. There's water. It's been colored red and got lights underneath it and it bubbles. And then there's obstacles where you try to navigate 
through this pool of water that looks like lava. There's things you can jump on, furniture. You try to get to the other side of the room unscathed. And so maybe there's a team of three people and they try to go across this floor that is lava and get to a door on the other side. Now, what happens is this show is that very few people survive. Most end up falling in the lava. Is anybody kind of sick and twisted when you watch shows like this? You like pull for the people to fail? I'm kind of like that. I want to see that dude fall in the lava. So it's funny, it's very few people survive, but this is true. No one gets across without getting a little bit of lava on them. And nobody gets across the floor that's lava without some struggle and strain. And what a great picture of life on planet earth. The Bible says there is none of us that's righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10 The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, get this great reality. The God who created the cosmos is perfect and holy, but every one of us are imperfect and unholy. None of us can reach to God and attain his level of perfection. Apart from his grace and mercy, we are left to our sin, cut off and separated from our holy God. Apart from his grace and mercy, none of us can ever tap into the real reason we're alive, and that is a relationship with him. We're all marked by this thing called sin. We have this problem, and we need God and his mercy and grace and love to speak to us from his word and to give us some truth for this problem we all have. And as we live in 21st century America where there's so much anger and angst, bitterness and brokenness, problems and pain, corruption and confusion like never before, God's people need to come into the house of the Lord this morning and look at the word of God and see what the Holy Spirit says to us. What can we do with this problem we all have? Number one, I want to remind us this. God wants us to deal with our problem. 1 John 3, 7 through 10, John provides four truths designed to help first century believers navigate through a world marked by sin. We can apply these to our lives and we learn from John, first of all, that God, God wants us to deal with our problem. Look at verse number seven. John says, children, that reminds us he's writing to Christians. God loves us. And when we're born again, he regards each of us as his children. Never forget you are deeply loved by the Lord. He desires a relationship with you. In fact, he calls you, Matthew 5, 6, to call him your heavenly father. Children, let no one deceive you. Everybody say that word deceive. It's a, it's a word that means to lead astray or to cause to wander to go down a trail or a path and get lost by one who leads you astray. And and know this, throughout human history, Satan has wanted people to be deceived about this topic called sin. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he exists to blind people concerning their brokenness. He exists to blind people from seeing the truth of Christ and being freed. Let no one deceive you. He says, the one who does what is righteous is righteous. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. Now, many people get confused about the verses we're looking at this morning. Some would say here, if you don't do what is righteous all the time, that must mean you're not righteous. That's not John's point. John's addressing false teachers who said it was all right to engage in sexual fornication. There was great immorality in the first century churches in Asia Minor. And John is speaking concerning that issue and he's reminding his readers that those who are born of Christ, those who are truly redeemed, should be seeking after lives of righteousness. John is reminding Christians in churches, listen, God wants you to deal with your brokenness. God wants you to deal with your sin. 
He didn't save you for you to stay in sin. He wants to change you. He wants to make you a new creation in Christ. He wants you to pursue after the right type of life he has made you to live. Apostle wanted his readers to know that true believers are called to live transformed lives. Listen, believer, Jesus doesn't want you to stay shackled to indwelling sin. Listen, Christian, this morning, God wants you to deal with the biggest problem. God wants you to be different than people in your family. The Lord wants you to embrace his righteousness and shine the light of Jesus in a dark world. Don't be deceived. God doesn't want us to stay in sin. He doesn't want us to live like we used to live. He has saved us to make us different. He he has saved us to make us holy. He has saved us to reflect his character to a broken world. We are alive for a reason. We are in Christ for a reason. He wants us to live like Jesus so that we can give praise to the Father and so that we can offer hope and help to those who are still deceived by Satan. God wants us to deal with our biggest problem. He wants us to live differently. He wants us to pursue righteousness. Now know, know this, you can only deal with your biggest problem through Christ. See, the Bible doesn't call you to mere behavior modification. The Bible doesn't say, hey, try to be good through your own strength. No, the Bible and the Gospels and Jesus teach us that we can only have true righteousness through Christ. See, before you can be different from the world, you need the Lord to do something in your heart. You see, only the gospel can make you new. Only the gospel can give you power over your bad habits and your hangups. Only the blood of Jesus and the power of the cross can set you free from besetting sin and addiction. See, before you can be different, and in order to deal with your problem, you've got to look to Calvary where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for your sins. You've got to look to Jesus who has broken the power of Satan and sin. You've got to look to Jesus who can transform your thinking and your heart. You've got to have the Holy Spirit of God in your soul. So maybe there's one here this morning, you've never been saved, you've never been born again, there's never been that time in your life where you called out to Jesus asking him to save you, but you know you're struggling with an attitude, an addiction, a bad habit or some behavior. You seem incapable of controlling your temper or your speech. That thing, that person seems to have control over you. Know this, other world religions call you to Be good for God. The Bible says Jesus was good on your behalf. He he lived, died, and was raised for you. And if you will, in faith, call out to him and ask him to save you from your sins, the Bible teaches that God will forgive you of all of your sins and he'll give you a new nature in Christ. He'll change you, transform you. So know this, you have no power to change in and of yourself. You need the wounded, crucified, and risen Christ to do what you cannot do for yourself. And then once you are in Christ, the Lord wants you by that Holy Spirit within you to pursue a relationship with him, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3, 18, and to allow him to gradually, progressively, incrementally change you into all that he wants you to be. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, the Lord wants us to deal with our biggest problem. This was John's message to the first century churches in Asia Minor. He's saying, church, don't believe what the world's telling you. Don't stay in your sin. Instead, pursue righteousness. Paul would call churches later, or earlier in Ephesians 4, 24, he would say this to the church, put on the new self the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and in purity of the truth. Oh, hear Bible doctrine this morning. There's a lot of religious messages out there. There's a lot of complicated forms of Christianity, but know the simple gospel and hear the call of Scripture. How do we live in the world in which we live in? The Bible calls us to know the gospel 
to know Jesus and then to pursue righteousness so that his name may be made great through our lives. What can we do with our biggest problem? Our text teaches us, the Bible teaches us, first of all, that God wants us to deal with our problem. Number two, our text reminds us that God has fought the battle over our problem. Now, I've mentioned this already in a way, but man, the victory over sin doesn't come from self. The victory over sin comes through the cross. It comes through Christ. It comes through Calvary. Uh, See, this morning, maybe you're struggling with something. Uh, Maybe this past week, you feel a little bit defeated because you've had a bad attitude. You got snippy with someone, lost your cool. You gave in to some area. You, You felt stained by this world in the past week. Maybe you come in here this morning and you feel a little bit down, you feel a little bit defeated. Ever been there before? I have. Hey, you think it's bad to feel that way when you come to church? You ought to feel that way when you're the preacher. You got to get up and preach. Every once in a while, I'll be tempted to feel a little bit down and then struggling with the world, the flesh, the devil. I almost feel like not praying because I'll feel this distance and kind of this little bit of defeat. I'm thankful as many times about that time the Holy Spirit will remind me, hey, it's not up to you anyhow. I didn't save you because of anything you did. I saved you because of what my son did. There's sometimes on a Sunday morning, I'm down here on the front row and I have to remind myself it is Jesus and the cross that gives me my worth and my security, not myself. This is, the, this is the Christian message. Jesus has fought our battle over our problem, and we look to him in faith. Look at verse number eight at what John said. He said, the one who commits sin is of the devil. Again, don't get tripped up there. Some people, I mean, I grew up and I'd read that verse and think, wow, I must be of the devil. I committed a sin this past week. Remember the context. Context is many times king when you're studying scripture. John's dealing with people who were, again, encouraging sexual sin within the church. Not just committing it, encouraging it. So John's saying, hey, those people in the church who have this pattern and practice of promoting sin, they're of the devil. Why could he say that? I mean, that's a pretty strong claim. He's of the devil. She's of the devil. I mean, we kind of mock that type of talk nowadays when someone says someone's of the devil how could John writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit say that well he knew the the life history of the devil He, he knew that the devil at the beginning of time is the one who hijacked God's intent for humanity right he entered into the human picture and led Adam and Eve to commit the original sin so indeed Christians can say sin is of the devil, and those who commit sin are of the devil. Why? Jesus said this. He told the religious leaders of his days, you are of your father, the devil. What does it mean to be of the devil? It means that one is still shackled to sin. One is still under the bondage of brokenness. You see, you are either this morning in Christ or you are, as Scripture says, in sin. And if you are in sin, you are following the ways of the devil. See, every man, every boy, every woman, every girl was created for the glory of God to know his or her creator. And Satan has led people astray. So there's people who believe God doesn't exist. They can look at the entire creative order and not even see the handiwork of the Lord. They're blinded by Satan. There are people in sin. and They boast and they brag of their sin. And they argue against anyone who would even speak of the word sin. Why do people sometimes get so vehemently unnerved by those who would speak of their sin? Because their conscience, Romans 2.14, bears witness that they're following the ways of the world. And what's more is that they are deceived here by the devil. John says the one who commits sin is of the devil. 
For the devil has sinned from the beginning, Genesis 3, 1 through 7. And then look what he says. So that's all bad news, right? Wow, people are of the devil. But then look what he says. The son of God was revealed. You could translate that appeared. The son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the devil's works. See, the bad news of the Bible is this. Satan seemingly hijacked God's original intent for creation. We are all victims of that original sin. We're all marked by brokenness and imperfection. We all say, think, and do so many things that fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news of the Bible and the bad news of life. But the good news is this. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. See, it may have seemed that Satan won in the Garden of Eden, but even then God had a plan. Genesis 3.15, the Lord said, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, speaking of Jesus, and you will strike his heel. Jesus said this, John 12.31, When he came to the earth, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Friends, look at what's going on in the world. It may seem like Satan has power. It may seem like he's winning. It may seem like sin is increasing, and indeed it is. But know this, Jesus has defeated Satan, sin, and death. Satan has been rendered powerless Revelation 20, 1 through 3, John spoke of the way in which he received a prophetic vision, the way in which Satan was cast out and will be cast out. People often debate on that passage. Did it speak of the past or the future? I would say both. Jesus defeated Satan, and because of it, we have guarantee that one day he will be vanquished forever. So Satan has power over the world in a sense. But John writes to remind his readers, even though you live in this messed up world and so much sin and confusion and error around you, man, don't give up. Don't become negative. Don't go in a cave and hide from the world. Uh, Know this, 1 John 4, 4, he'll say it later. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them. You have overcome the world because the one who is in you is the greater than the one who is in the world. What a word for 21st century society, 21st century Christians. Why would we ever become unnecessarily pessimistic? Why would we ever give up? Jesus has overcome God has fought the battle over our problem. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. We have power and strength in him, and we have hope that there is coming a day in which Jesus, King Jesus, will rule righteously upon the earth, and there will be no more Satan, there will be no more sin forever. So church, Let's be full of courage and cheer and put our eyes on this truth that John here gives us. John gives a third truth. He reminds believers, number three, that God has given us power to fight our problem. I can remember becoming a Christian and and I can remember years later I made a recommitment to Christ. I shared this past week in celebrate recovery on Monday night, uh, my testimony. And I shared of how I became a believer and then having not been discipled, I became overcome really by sin and bad acquaintances and influences. And I walked away from the Lord seemingly, but I, but I knew all along that I was still a Christian. And I, I, I shared this past week that uh, during that time of rebellion and sin, I knew I was a Christian because I I couldn't sin and get away with it. I felt miserable as I engaged in certain things I had engaged in before. But then I can remember recommitting my life to the Lord and thinking, how am I ever going to have power over this thing, this struggle? 
I can remember certain things just like my speech, my talk, the words I used. Thought, how can I ever change? I remember being brought to a point where I felt so low because I felt helpless in and of myself to overcome, to fight against old bad habits and hang-ups. I realized one Sunday morning around the front of the church praying over those struggles, I realized it was as if the Lord was telling me. I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was as if he was making me aware. I've got you right where I want you. You realize you can't do it on your own. Lord got me to the place where I had to see I needed help from someone other than myself. Me or Patrick Latham, I realized, cannot produce the life of God. So there's a lot of religious people who try to produce the life of God in their own strength, and they're really living almost like lost people, trusting in their own abilities and not the abilities of the Lord. You see, this is the message of Christianity. While other religions may say, follow these rules and God will be happy with you, the Bible says Jesus has followed all the rules and he's the only means of making God happy with you. And then Christianity says, furthermore, when you believe in Christ, he will transform you on the inside by putting his spirit within you. And then the life you live isn't by you trying to follow rules and impress God and others. No, the life you live is because of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is the spirit of God that can take your mere human shell and cause it or enable it to perform or to live like Christ. John speaks of this in verse number nine. He says, everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. I think it's interesting here. He had just referenced in verse eight the promise of the son being revealed to defeat Satan. That promise was Genesis 3.15 that spoke of the seed of the woman coming to crush Satan. Here John goes back to this concept of the seed and talks about how the seed of God now lives within us through the Holy Spirit. Wow, what wonderful truth. Everyone who is born of God does not sin. What birth is he talking about there? I believe he's talking about that John 3, 3 birth. That John 3, 3 birth is that one where Jesus said, you must be born again. When Jesus preached that message and said, you must be born again, there's a man there, a religious man, who said, well, what do you mean? How do I, do I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? He didn't get it. Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth. Spiritual birth. I, I remember preaching years ago in, up in New Jersey. I was actually there. I have a picture of the Twin Towers on August 11th, 2001. A month later, those Twin Towers were hit. But I was in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. There was a bridge in that city where you could look over and see the Twin Towers. And I took a picture from that bridge. I was preaching in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. I remember preaching that morning and the pastor getting up and handling the invitation after I preached. And he said, here's the deal. Everybody here has had a birthday, a physical birthday. Independent Baptist preacher. Everybody here has had a physical birthday the question is have you ever had a spiritual birthday if you've never had a spiritual birthday you can have one right now today by understanding and responding to what this young man just said that day we had a man come forward to confess Christ and ask the Lord to save him practice of that church when you got saved you got baptized immediately I was kind of shocked I'm down front, and this man comes forward and says, I need to be saved. Preacher turned around, fill up the baptistry. Baptized him a few moments later. Always stuck with me, though. Hear, hear the message this morning. Hear what John's talking about. We are mere physical beings. We have physical shells, but we've been created for a relationship with God. So you get this, Christianity is not about rules. It's about a relationship. In order to have that relationship, John 4, 24, those who worship the Lord must worship him in spirit and in truth. You need the spirit of God in your soul. And that spirit of God comes, Galatians 3, 2, the moment you in faith believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and ask God the Father to forgive you of your sins based on what Jesus has done. When that spirit comes to live within you, you receive power. The word here translated born in our verse is a, appears in the perfect tense. 
Why is that important? A perfect tense verb speaks of an action that took place in the past that has continual abiding results. John's trying to give the real believers, are you a real believer this morning? He's trying to give the real believers truth this morning to help them in their battle against sin. And he tells them, if you've been born of God, if you've been born of him, if his seed remains in you, you'll have victory over sin. Now, if you were to study 1 John, you would learn that the recurring, one of the recurring sins, there was a, an issue with fornication because of what's known as the Gnostic heresy, but there was also an, an issue with unloving behavior in the church. Now, we don't really know what was going on, but there was some unloving, hateful behavior in the church. I mean, John, we'll look at this next week, even has to speak of people who hated one another in the assembly. Now, I'd like to know what all was going on, wouldn't you? I mean, it'd be neat if he would have written a, an addendum here to explain, you know, what was happening. I mean, would you all like to hear about all that gossip? Figure it all out? The, the Holy Spirit, in good wisdom, knew not to include the details for us because we would have got, oh boy, look at all that they were doing. So we just know there was unloving, hateful behavior of some sort. It, John's wanting to remind the readers, hey, there may be some hateful people in your midst and you're struggling with loving them. You're struggling with obeying the Lord. But guess what? You can do it. You can overcome. You can be different. Why? Because the Spirit of God is within you. And according to Scripture, Romans 5, 5, it is the Spirit of God that produces the virtue of love in our hearts. According to Galatians 5, it is the Spirit of God in our souls, not our mere effort, not our abilities. It is the Spirit of God that comes into our lives through salvation. When we learn to abide in Christ and live by faith, it is the Spirit of God that will produce the Christ life in us. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So believer, if you want to deal with your biggest problem, can I encourage you, don't look to yourself. Don't look to your abilities. Don't get caught up examining your mere flesh. Look to the Spirit of God. Look to Jesus. Learn to walk with the Lord daily by the Spirit. Learn Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you learn to keep your eyes on the Lord and trust in his spirit in a moment by moment abiding relationship, something supernatural can happen in your heart, soul, and mind. The Lord can produce Christ in you. And the spirit can produce all of the Lord's character through your life. Don't give in to defeat. Don't feel you have to stay where you are. Don't believe the lie you can't change. Don't blame your circumstances or your upbringing for patterns of defeat. Don't think that you have to live with that guilt, that bitterness, that fear, that shame. Don't believe it's too late for you to be made new. The Holy Spirit can change you, and he wants to change you. If you aren't saved this morning, trust in Christ and allow God to forgive you of your sins and put his spirit within you. If you are saved, learn how to have not just a religious life, but a relationship with the living God where his spirit can change you from the inside out. God has given us power to fight our problem. And lastly, I would say this. Our text shows us that God wants us to be different than the world when it comes to our problem. You know, I can remember thinking this as I was first struggling with sin in my own life as a believer. Why should I change? You know, if the Lord really loves me and saved me and, man, I believe I'm going to heaven when I die, why fight against all this stuff? I I remember having friends in college who professed Christ and they lived like the world, partied it up, man, did a lot of ungodly stuff. They could be at church on Sunday morning, raising their hands, singing praises to Jesus. Why not just live like that if God loves me? Why try to be different? And the Lord took me through a process where I had to learn that, number one, I should aim to be different because he's created me to be different. 
It gives him praise and glory when he sees you and he sees me living like Christ. Uh, Number two, I learned this. Man, it's good for my own soul if I seek to live like this because I realized I was miserable and convicted in my conscience when I engaged in any type of sin. So I want to do it for his glory, for my own good. And then the Lord helped me see this. It it was good for me to aim to live different because I had friends, I had coworkers who needed to see Jesus through me. In fact, I can remember meeting people at work and find out I'm a Christian and there was folks in Atlanta say, I've never known a Christian before. The Lord convicted me, Patrick, you may be, see, be the only Jesus they ever see. So aim to live a different type of life. John wanted his readers to understand this principle. He said in verse 10, this is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. You see, the Lord wants there to be distinctions. Sometimes we don't like to stick out like a sore thumb. Sometimes we don't like to be different. But hear me, church, the world needs to see Christians who are different. They need an obvious testimony. That's why the Lord called us salt. That's why he called us light. We're to stick out and to stand out for his glory so that people will know there is a God who can make all things new. This is how God's children, the devil's children, become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God. So present tense verbs here, and this will help you understand this passage. When John speaks of sin and unrighteousness, he's using present tense verbs that speak of a continual action. So when he says, whoever does not do what is right is not of God, He's not saying that if you have a single instance of failure or if you struggle in a certain area that you're not of God. He's speaking of the people in the church who are openly promoting sin. And he's saying they're not of God. Because if I read that, you know, this past week, man, I think it was Tuesday. I had a pretty bad day. Has anybody ever had a bad day? And I had an attitude. You could ask Laura about it. If you pay her $5, she may give you some details. But I kind of had that attitude. There's this country song that says, I just want to be mad for a while. Has anybody ever been there before? I'm just going to have an attitude. I know I'm the preacher, but I'm going to have an attitude. So, you know, after about a couple hours of doing that, I thought, this is wrong. I need to confess. Get my heart and mind clean with Jesus. And get this right. Right? So I could look this morning and look at that verse and see, whoever does not do what is right is not of God. Oh my goodness, this past week, I did not do what was right. I must not be of God. Well, thanks be to God, he has saved me and he has cleansed me and the blood of Jesus has made me not guilty before God the Father. I'm thankful for that, but know the meaning of the verse here. John is addressing the habitual sinners who promoted sin in the fellowship. So he's wanting to tell the readers, those people openly espousing fornication as a means to godliness, know this, they're not of God. Then he says, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. So those hateful people in your midst, their problem is they haven't been converted. They need to get saved. But, but no, no, notice the beginning of the verse. He says, this is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. He, he's showing that there should be a distinction between those who belong to the world and those who belong to the Lord. And he's saying there should specifically be a distinction when it comes to this issue of loving one another. You see, by God's divine design, he intends for us to be witnesses for him in this world. It is his intent for his children. He gets great glory. He loves this. It is his intent for his children who have been changed then to be, as Paul would say, like jars of clay that carry the glory of Christ to this messed up and broken world. The Lord wants there to be distinctions. And love is the main distinction between the children of God and the children of Satan. Love is to be the distinguishing factor. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. The apostles taught, 
1 Corinthians 13, 13, that love is the greatest commandment. Romans 13, 9, that love is the fulfillment of all of God's law. And John shares this truth here because there was some messed up, unloving behavior in the churches in Asia Minor, and he's reminding the true Christians, listen, I want there to be an obvious difference. The Lord wants there to be an obvious difference between you and all the people of the world. And know this, you're called to love. And John meant to show that true righteousness and love are to be defining traits of true Christians. God wants us to be different than the world when it comes to to our biggest problem. And when the world looks at us, they should see the Lord through us. And know this truth about our biggest problem. The Lord's called us uh, to himself. He's dealt with our biggest problem. Now he wants us to walk in righteousness. And he doesn't just call us to do it through our own strength. He gives us his spirit. And if we pursue these things and pursue this truth and walk with him, then our lifestyles will be witnesses for him in this world. 